Happy Monday, and welcome back to the Lorden Arts channel. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with us here today. Case Cracked is the show where we look into a mystery, and what are the critical pieces that help solve that mystery? Today's episode is called Three Tries at Justice. Lori Houts was born on February 6th, 1967 in Las Vegas, Nevada. After her birth, her family moved to San Jose, California. There, she would eventually attend Gunderson High School and graduate from the University of California. Lori had a love of computers, and her friends and family noted that she also had a very kind heart. Whether it was work in the classroom or playing co-ed softball or basketball, Lori was just a force to be reckoned with. After her postgraduate studies, Lori worked as a computer engineer for Adobe Systems. She was a vibrant young woman whose friends and family felt that the work she did in the tech field was ahead of its time. These roles were often traditionally masculine in nature, but Lori had a deep love of STEM. STEM is an acronym for science, technology, engineering, and math. When children are young, both boys and girls can find these areas of study to be very interesting. But at the time, women tended to go on to what were deemed more feminine careers due to societal pressures. Even today, there are still challenges achieving greater gender equality in some of these fields. Lori wanted very much for more young women to thrive in these roles as well. On September 5th, 1992, she was leaving work on Charleston Road to finish up a few things before meeting her boyfriend, Brent Fulmer, to attend a wedding that night. The couple had only been dating for about five weeks, but were quickly becoming very close. Several hours later, a jogger running about a mile from Adobe Systems near a trash dump saw a car parked on the side of the road. When he looked through the window, he saw the body of a woman who appeared to be dead. It looked as though she had been strangled by a three-foot-long nylon rope that was still wrapped around her. It had been tightened using a square knot. When investigators arrived at the scene, they quickly concluded that this wasn't a robbery. Her purse was found nearby, having been thrown over a fence, but her wallet was still in it and still contained all of her money and her identification. There was no forced entry found on the car, which made investigators theorize that She might have known her attacker and actually let him in. Evidence at the scene also suggested that the murder had not been committed there. Rather, the killer strangled her at another location and drove the car to where it was found before abandoning it. When the inside of the car was examined for evidence, they found that Lori had put up quite a struggle. Her footprints were still visible on the dashboard and windshield in the front of her car. At first... Brent was their prime suspect, but when his alibi turned out to be rock solid, he was eliminated as a person of interest. No one at her workplace or in the immediate area had really noticed her car. Friends and family said no one knew of anyone who would even want to hurt her. Was this just a random act of violence or something more sinister? Further examination of Lori's car showed several fingerprints. Some were hers, some were Brent's, and others found on the outside of the car, were from his roommate, John Woodward. Woodward was a technical engineer who worked in the area. He and Lori had known each other since July of 1990. Woodward denied any involvement in Lori's death, but had no alibi for the time of her murder. Investigators were told that Woodward had killed Lori in a fit of rage, that he was actually in love with his roommate Brent, and was very jealous of the relationship with Lori. Brent agreed to wear a wire for investigators and talk to Woodward. During the conversation, Woodward asked Brent what evidence the police had on him, and then suggested that he and Brent meet in an abandoned parking lot to discuss things further. When Brent asked point blank if he had killed Lori, Woodward gave an evasive response, but didn't admit or deny the accusation. A few months after her death, Woodward was arrested and charged with her murder. Prosecutors knew this case would be hard to prove because they were unable to show that Woodward was ever in Lori's car. His prints were found on the outside, but he claimed that that happened one night recently when Lori had visited Brent. His defense attorney stated that the claim Woodward had killed Lori in a fit of rage because he was in love with Brent was homophobic. 
No evidence was found to support anything except that the two had a friendship. The jury was unable to render a decision, ending the case as a mistrial. A few years later, Woodward would be rearrested. This time, the presiding judge kept the aspect of the murder being over romantic jealousy out of the courtroom. When the jury couldn't reach a verdict again, the judge dismissed the case due to insufficient evidence. Prosecutors were told that unless new evidence came to light, there would be no new trial. Year after year, Lori's case was re-examined by investigators. DNA would have been no use to detectives back in 1992, but in 2005, there were many more options available. DNA samples were taken from the rope that had been used to strangle Lori, and after testing and analysis, it was found to match Woodward. Investigators were also able to process many more of the prints found inside and outside of the car. Over 80 of those prints were re-examined. This resulted in finding even more prints from the car that matched Woodward. Fibers were found on the rope that matched fibers taken from a pair of sweatpants investigators found in Woodward's car in 1992. With this new evidence, in 2020, the case was reopened. Investigators immediately began searching for Woodward, but were initially unable to find him. Now, they just had to wait until he resurfaced. In July of 2022, investigators were notified by the Department of Homeland Security that Woodward would be flying into the United States from the Netherlands on the 9th. It seems that after his second trial, he moved to the Netherlands while he worked for a company called ReadyTech, an international training software company where he eventually became CEO. Upon landing in New York City, officers arrested him for murder. He has denied all of the charges against him. As they emotionally prepare for now a third trial, the Houts family had this to say via a statement to the press, quote, Lori Ann Houts was a beloved family member and friend to many. She had a huge heart and her humor and spunk were endearing to all. The way Lori lived and treated people was a stunning example of what's right in the world. She was a gem to so many, but her bright life was taken from us at the age of 25. We're hopeful that justice can finally be served for Lori and incredibly appreciative of the law enforcement agencies who have never given up on her. Do they think that they can get a conviction this time? Her sister Cindy had this to say, quote, it doesn't really matter what happens because Lori's not coming back. It's not a win or lose. We've already lost. Case cracked. I would like to thank the sun.com, people.com, newspapers.com, bestcolleges.com, ancientfaces.com, abc7 news, abtc.ng and the Washington Post. Of course, the biggest thank you goes to Christy Arnhart for researching and writing up today's case. And here she is to discuss it with us now. Well, Christy, obviously the big question in this case, will the third time be the charm? And I think the only way to know that is to maybe look at what went wrong the first two times around. Based on what I'm seeing around this case, it looks like there was a lot of circumstantial evidence that was presented in those first two trials. It's just kind of weird because we know that they have the murder weapon, you know, mm -hmm. like why couldn't they get a conviction? Yeah. And usually when you have something like that, it's, it's just a sure shot. Right. This one, you know, the circumstantial evidence weighs it down even though it lends credibility, you know, they have fingerprints on the exterior of the car, but not the inside. Right. Well, that's not a, a real big thing, especially if he was roommates with her boyfriend. Yeah. Then you've got the rope itself, but they have no strong analysis from it proving that he handled it. Back in the mid nineties. Yeah. Yes. So that could yes. be a differentiator for, yeah. Going into this next one. Oh yes. Yeah. yeah. Now, you know, both previous trials were plagued with controversy, mainly due to the perceived weakness of the evidence in the prosecution alleging that Woodward, who is gay, was jealous of Laurie's relationship with his roommate. Now, this motive was criticized by Tom Nolan. He was the first trial's defense attorney. Yep. You know, he, he criticized it as being homophobic. And then we have the judge in the second trial disallowing that motive altogether. It's kind of weird to me to disallow it altogether like that, just because 
I've seen plenty of situations where someone starts dating someone and friends get jealous and it doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. even have to be a romantic interest. It it could just be that, you know, it's like a lifelong friend. You guys have things and you know, they they have finances wrapped up in some way. I mean, they're they're roommates. Mm -hmm. Um there could be plenty of anger and animosity and worry and concern and big emotions that could drive you to do something, you know, crazy like this oh yeah uh, without having any of this context of oh it's because he was in love with his roommate so it's weird to me that in the second trial the judge would actually just like because it kind of cuts off that whole conversation then it's like okay well mm -hmm. we can't talk about the fact that there was some form of jealousy it doesn't have to be romantic um and it's interesting to me because if you do take that out of play it's like well then what what is the motive necessarily you know like, mm -hmm. is it enough to say, oh, this guy's worried about that he's going to have to move somewhere else or something? And and I don't know. For for certain people, it might be. That's the weird thing. Yeah. You, you never know. Um, but yeah, it's uh, so how, how close was it in the previous two trials? Well, it looks like the jury felt about the same way you do about it. Uh, the first one was actually eight to four. The second trial was seven to five. OK, OK. So, yeah, they were they were leaning towards letting him off so it actually might be a good thing that these trials were kind of logged as mistrials because i'm pretty sure yeah if he was acquitted that would be it they wouldn't be able to try this ever again so yeah. um and here we are over 25 years later mm -hmm. and they're trying it again uh, what's the differentiator here well the hope is that the new analysis of the rope is the direct physical evidence that they need to sway the jury in in their favor they have dna evidence from the rope that matches him but they also have fibers on the rope that match you know the sweatpants that he owned at the time and they were even they looked a lot like the rope from what i read they were hard to distinguish but they were there interesting yeah i mean fiber analysis is a little trickier because you know it's not, it's not like dna it's not like a one-to-one -one. and honestly even from what i'm seeing the dna is going to be a little bit different in this case uh, it's it's a different type that actually follows down the male chain, and it's not quite as exclusive in mm -hmm. terms of the numbers. Um, so it's going to be interesting just to see how that all plays out. Um, it's it's going to get a bit more technical, that's for sure. But at least they're talking about physical evidence at this point and the debates around that instead of what they were seeing as circumstantial. And, of mm -hmm. course, we have to say Woodward is innocent until proven guilty. I did go looking for information on trial dates. All I saw was mention of a preliminary trial that was scheduled to happen in August of 2022. And I haven't seen anything around it since. I would say it's probably going to be several more months before the actual trial begins. Probably some point in 2023, I would bet. But uh, where is Woodward now? Well, a judge granted him home arrest. So he's living at his brother's house with a GPS monitor on his ankle. Okay. He's only allowed to leave the house if he's going to work. And he still works for ReadyTech, mm -hmm. but he has resigned as the CEO. Probably a good move. Probably mm -hmm. a good move. Um, yeah. Gotcha. And I hear that there is some form of good happening in honor of Lori or in her name. This is always my favorite part. I, it's sad as it is. I love to see the good that comes out of this. Yeah. To keep her memory alive, the Houts family established the Lori Houts Memorial Girls Athletic Scholarship. The donations go to graduating female seniors who've been involved in sports all four years and plan to get a degree within a STEM discipline. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have made a donation. Thank you to all of our supporters. We appreciate you guys so we can do things like this. If you would like to contribute more, we'll have a link in the description box down below where you can make another donation directly to them as well. Awesome. Christy, thank you so much for all your work on today's episode. We really appreciate you. And I've got some other people to thank right now. Thank you. PayPal supporters, Carolyn Schmidt and Ann Peters. For over six years, we've always run limited commercial ads here on YouTube, and we can't do that without support. If you'd like to help the channel keep going, please visit lordandarts.com. There, you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even just buy us a coffee like Agla Sanchez recently did. 
We know that learning about the mechanisms that help support and find justice in these cases is important to understand the many unsolved cases we also cover. So we really appreciate your support in allowing us to continue doing that. Remember, you can get another Lord and Art story every week on the Seriously Mysterious podcast. A new episode is coming tomorrow and every Tuesday after that. Visit SeriouslyMysterious.com and subscribe on your favorite podcatchers. While you're here, don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell icon below if you want to catch one of our weekly secret studio live shows. And of course, I'll be back with a new unsolved mystery for you on Friday, right here on the Lord and Arts channel.